Okay, the Antichrist Empire. You, if you watch any kind of TV or Christian radio or anything, people throw the term Antichrist around like, you know, like a basketball sort of thing. They use it for all kinds of things. And, and, and John does too. John says um, there are many Antichrists. And essentially, anybody who preaches the opposite of what Jesus is teaching, they're an Antichrist, right? So, um, <clears throat> And, 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 you know, occasionally you'll hear it in the news. It's just, it just goes by so fast, and most people don't have a clue what <laughs> they're talking about. So it's even less, it, it catches your mind even less than the term Armageddon, right? Um, <clears throat> so in 95 AD, the Apostle John knew that a great Antichrist being would come on the scene in the last days of the human governments. And in 1 John 2.18, he writes, Little children... As you have heard, so they already knew this information, that the Antichrist is coming. And that was written about 95 AD. Well, before 95 AD, Paul had already written in the scriptures about the Antichrist's powers and activities. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away first. Well, you know, if... if uh, you know, if, if you're told, worship the beast power or die, you know, you can imagine there'll be some people fall away from the church of God. And we had a case years ago in the worldwide church of God where nobody was threatened with death or anything. <laughs> they just said, you don't have to keep the Sabbath or the holy days, the Feast of Tabernacles. You don't, you don't have to avoid eating shrimp and pork and stuff. Yet God loves you. You just go do anything you want to do. And there was a huge falling away on that day. They believed their pastor general, you know, knew what he was talking about, but he didn't give them any scriptural proof. They just said, yippee, I'm free at last, I'm free at last, you know. And there was a great falling away. But in this case, it'll be like, you do what the beast power says, or you're a dead person, what's your choice? You know, okay, do I die for what I believe in Christ, or do I keep living serve the beast power for a short time, then suffer the seven last plagues, and, and then not be in the first resurrection. So in that case, it should be a no-brainer. But if you haven't thought it through, if you haven't seen the scriptures, if you don't have them locked in your brain, you might forget that you read that some, once upon a time. So verse 4 of Second Thessalonians 2, He who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple, and that word could be shrine, right, holy place, holy area, of God showing himself that he is God. Now, what would a person have to do to sit somewhere with cameras, TV cameras rolling, and say, hello everybody, I am God. <laughs> you think it'd be Saturday, you think it's Saturday Night Live, right? <laughs> but in this case, Satan gives him power and miracle eyeing wonderful lying wonder miracles and so the world actually believes with the help of the Roman Catholic Church that this being is in fact the return of Jesus Christ and that's why Jesus said it ain't me if you didn't see me coming down on a white horse followed by angels on white horses meeting in the clouds you got to know that's the first time you get to see me not when I'm sitting in this, this guy is sitting in the temple of God or the temple area showing himself that he is God and having people believe it. This blaspheming people, person, will be accepted as the real Christ by billions who are not aware of Satan's lying wonders and the step, the steps. And each time you see a step, you should say to yourself, that was the hand of God. God is now ticking off the stages and the events. We're now closer, we're now closer, just like the seven last plagues. When the fifth one is over, you know the sixth one is coming. With the seven trumpets, when the first one is over, what do you know? You know the second trumpet is coming soon. When it's over, you know the third trumpet is coming soon. So God has laid it out. And so when these things are happening on the world scene, and people say, you, you, you're a Bible person. What does all this mean? You should have some idea of what it all means. And, and you know, 
before the Battle of Armageddon comes this other stuff, and before that comes this other stuff, and before that comes this other stuff, and that brings us to today. <laughs> right? And they go, wow, how did you know so much? Oh, it's in the book. Here, I'll show it to you. It's right here. It's right here, Zechariah 14. Look, it's right here. It's right here. You know, and most people, they, if they read their Bible in a year, it's like, they read it at high speed. Zzz, oh, another chapter finished. Zzz, another chapter finished. Oh, yeah, yeah. But they're not assimilating. John 3.13 says, Jesus' lips, no man has ascended into heaven. So, two billion Jesus following people today say, yep, you go to heaven when you die. It's like, what's that verse mean? I don't know what I mean, but hey, he didn't mean that. <laughs> Oh, he wrote it in the Bible, he said it with his lips, but he didn't mean it. What kind of a Bible you got if he doesn't mean what he wrote, you know? Anyhow, so Jesus spoke of an abominable, desolated person, right? And I used to, you know, every time I read Matthew 24, it's like, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, then there's a little parenthetical statement at the end of that. It says, let him who understands read Daniel. You know, go look at the book of Daniel. Because Daniel is the Old Testament book of Revelation written way ahead of time. And when you mix Matthew 24 with Daniel, it starts to come alive. It's like, ah, and you mix in Revelation. It's like this event is the same as this event is the same as this event. Now you get a bigger picture of each event as it unfolds. Right? So Jesus said, the abominable, desolated person, right, at the future holy place, instead of saying at a future rebuilt temple. Now, some people say, don't worry, nothing much is going to happen until they spend five years rebuilding the temple. Don't count on it. When they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. And this, uh, how quickly did 9-11 come on us? Do you remember what you were doing on 9-10? 9, 10, no, 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 another day, you know, 9, 10, 9, 10. What were you doing in the morning of 9, 11, right? <laughs> I was supposed to be repairing a bathtub, and I was in the, the, the homeowner's house, and he had the TV on. Before I got to his house, the little guy on the radio said, well, it seems like an airplane has flown into the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. And I'm picturing a little Cessna. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh, no, somebody died. They flew their Cessna into the Twin Towers. And it's like, then I got to his house and the TV was on and they had film of a jet flying in there. Later I've heard people who saw it describe it as they watched it. You know, unbelievable. But anyhow, um, so in Matthew 24, 15, then when you see the abomination of desolation or the abominable desolated person spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he didn't say in the holy temple, and if you look at the Greek there, I gave it to you in the handout, it means spot, the holy spot, and some people will try to tell you that the temple wasn't built on top of the temple mount, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you better get some, there's a lot of evidence that it was not, well, we could, we could talk about that, yeah. but why would Solomon spend huge amounts of effort to build a huge temple mount, Gary's seen it. Those of you who have been to Jerusalem have walk, seen it or walked on it, right? And, and, it's a, and it's an elevated plateau above the whole city, and it's called the Temple Mount. And to have the temple built somewhere else, it'd be like, what, shouldn't the temple be on the Temple Mount? But, but that'd be interesting to look at. Um, okay, he says, in the holy spot, right? So God has foretold the benchmark timeline events of man's history in the book of Daniel. Which, which most people, it's like, Daniel is so hard to understand. Well, you can say, Book of Revelation is so hard to understand. You can even say, Matthew 24 is so hard to understand. Okay, but, he, but Jesus in Matthew 24 said, go back and study Daddy, Daniel. So now you're studying Daniel with Matthew 24, right? And, oh, wait, this, is, this corresponds with this, and this here, and this. Then you read Revelation, and the first trumpet, and the second trumpet, the third trumpet, the fourth trumpet, the fifth. Oh, they correspond with what Daniel wrote. Oh, look, they correspond. And God will help you if you seek to know. He will help you. So in Nebuchadnezzar's dream back in the Old Testament, Daniel, God lists out for Daniel the four great Middle Eastern empires after Daniel's time, right, in man's history. Daniel 2.32. Image of head, 
uh, the image's head of gold, the chest of arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are this head of gold. So he sees in his dream this head of gold image all the way down to the toes. And, and Daniel says, God is telling me that you, your Babylonish empire in the Middle East, is the head of gold. Yours is the most splendiferous of empires in the Middle East, right? And he said, but after you, after, <laughs> after, your, after your empire is gone, right, right, will arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. Now, in 2 verse 40, the fourth kingdom, so he's saying, okay, and then, and then he identifies for it. Like in this part, he just says, um, here these kingdoms are coming, the second and the third and the fourth kingdom. But then in Daniel 8.20, he, he identifies which of these great empires he's talking about. In verse 20 of Daniel 8, the ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of, the Me of Media and Persia. Well, you go back in your history book, right? And, and Babylon was destroyed in one night, and Daniel was there. <laughs> Daniel was there interpreting for the, the writing on the wall, and he said, tonight, you're, you're out of here. You're done, right? And so the Persian, the Medes and the Persians captured Babylon, and they became the next great empire. And then in Daniel 21, he says, the male goat, is the kingdom of Greece. Well, who's the great empire that came out of Greece? Anybody? Alexander, Alexander the Great, right? Who was the forerunner of the Greco-Roman Empire, right? But, but, you know, and then when he died, they split his kingdom up into four generals who took different parts of the kingdom, and then later on the Roman Empire came on the scene. But next we see that the last of man's kingdoms is crushed at Armageddon by the returning Christ. Matthew, I mean, Daniel 2, 34. And you, know, you watched in the stone that was cut out with hand, without hands. Okay, what's that? Well, that's something God did, right? A stone that is cut out without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke in pieces. Verse 35, then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were all crushed together. All the influences we have from Babylon, all the influences from the Medo-Persian Empire, all of the historic influences you know, that we carry on down today, the mythology, the Greek mythology and all that stuff, it all gets crushed. He drains the swamp with the Battle of Armageddon. It's finished, right? So that no trace of them was found, right? And I saw a guy on TV the other day, he was saying Christmas and Easter and Halloween, you know, they all come from... Babylon, they all come from the, the Tower of Babel, right? Ba way back at the beginning of setting up human empires and human religious belief, right? And, and, and you, can, you can trace it all the way back. But anyhow, so he said, no trace of them was found, and the stone became a great mountain that filled the old, whole earth. Well, that's language that means when Jesus returns to the planet, he becomes king, president of planet earth, and his kingdom of God on earth rules every place on planet Earth, even including Australia. Eventually, they'll get people down there, and those Australians, they'll start doing the God's way and keeping feasts and tabernacles and doing all you know, what God wants them to do. So a deep study shows that there is coming a... Tricky. i going to stop doing that. Okay. There's, there is coming a revival of the Holy Roman Empire. If you read through World War II literature, Hitler thought that he was getting together the Third Reich. Anybody know what Reich means in, in, in German? Kingdom. Okay, kingdom. Thousand year period, millennium. He was set, setting up, he was going to bring about a German world peace government for a thousand years because he knew how to make war better than anybody else. And then God said, nope. <laughs> I'm going to stir up the American people and on D-Day there will be all kinds of people go on to Normandy and we will crush the Germans and then we will crush the Japanese and that will be the end of World War II and we'll have to wait for World War III before things get really nasty and we have the tribulation. 
So a deep study shows there's coming this revival of the Holy Roman Empire. This three and a half year revival will then be crushed by the mountain of God's government to rule the whole planet. And it says on one super special day in the future, the beast king's evil empire will be destroyed and the beast will be put to death. And I personally think that's going to be the day of atonement just before the Feast of Tabernacles. And he, Jesus returns, the way I understand it, on the Feast of Trumpets, first day of the seventh month. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, seventh day, eighth day, ninth day. Okay, so there's nine days in which you can see Jesus coming down, splitting the mountain, sending out the seven bowls of God's wrath, right? You send one a day or whatever, right? And then the Battle of Armageddon could be on the Day of Atonement, making whatever's left of planet Earth at peace with God, right? There are no more serious enemies to Jesus taking control of the planet Earth, and, and the sins, the past sins of the swamp of humanity are done away, blotted out, pushed aside, and now we've got the 10th day of the month, the 11th day, the 12th day, the 13th day, and the 14th day for messengers to go to all the nations of the earth to tell them, get some emissaries up to the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day to listen to King Jesus, who is now president of the world, right? And airplanes will still fly. You will still be able to get an Australian president or a prime minister to get on an airplane and fly from Australia to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles between the Day of Atonement, the 10th day, and the 15th day, Feast of Tabernacles. It makes sense to me. But anyhow, so Revelation 19:20, the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence to deceive those who, who uh, received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire. And, you know, that might even be on film in a museum somewhere to remind people that if you oppose God, you are going to end badly, right? And, and essentially, once the king is dead, it's over. You know, all your, all your soldiers are dead. The king is dead. The false prophet is dead. It's over. It's finished. Verse 21. And the rest, the beast armies, were killed by the sword that proceeds out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And that ties in with Revelation where it says, um, and come to the supper. Come to the great supper. There's two suppers in the book of Revelation, which is really curious. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb, which I expect is a really fine banquet. <laughs> The, the other supper is where the birds and the animals eat the dead bodies. You know, it's, I don't particularly want to go to that one. I, I just want to go to the banquet of the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? So for the next thousand years, God's leadership people will be helping humans enhance planet Earth into the most unimaginable Garden of Eden paradise. You know, I mean, Garden of Eden, the way God built it, was glorious, Right? And then Satan and the first sin, and they got pushed out of the garden, and then it disappeared, and we don't know what it was or where it is, or, you know, it's gone, right? But, but God is going to make planet Earth the fabulous place for humans to live and children to play in the street, and nobody will be abused, and no women will be raped, and they will learn how to live according to God's commandments and God's festivals and God's holy day of the Sabbath and so on. So this comes about after... The Antichrist's evil empire is crushed by the armies of the King of Kings and Lord.